Mr. Vero, do you agree? Perfect. So I will share my, my screen now if I have a presentation. Okay. So as you know, today we are going to, to be focusing the, the discussion topic on gene expression modeling. So welcome. This is the second meeting that we are having for this first session already in, the, in this list of seminars organized by the Center for Reproducible Biomedical Modeling. Uh, I'm Samuel, and together Veronica and Joseph that are part in the audience, we organize this, this activity. So um, starting with what is modeling and what are the motivations behind of cell modeling, we already are aware of biological knowledge. And in general, what we try to do is reduce all this knowledge in what we call models that usually are computational and mathematical. So basically, uh, what we try to do with this is to uh, obtain engineering design um, prediction applications that can have uh, many, uh, many applications in medicine, in biotechnology, in order to, to take something from, from nature, from the biology, uh, specifically from a model that can be a, a cell or, in, or any other model that we can imagine that can be engineered uh, using biology. So covering the modeling, uh, we organize a series of different seminars uh, within this edition. We cover not only modeling approaches, we cover different fields of application of modeling, uh, starting with protein signaling, that was uh, the last month. And today we are here uh, to talk about gene expression with Dr. Melissa Fini and Dr. David Arnosti. And uh, just mentioned that this is supposed to be uh, every second Tuesday uh, from January to August, but we have an exception, that is that the next meeting, that is Cardax issue, going to be delivered on Monday. So if you want to, to be a, put it in your calendar, just in case. And starting with the topic of today, I'm going to just do a very naive introduction just to, uh, well, first, some seminar information that I was for you know, that is basically the structure. Um, we start with an introduction of five minutes. That is where we are now. Uh, first workshop or presentation or seminar that is going to be, in this case, Melissa Kini. Then we will move to David Arnosti. And when, then we will have a group discussion uh, around 25 minutes, 30 minutes uh, with questions from the audience and some guidelines for discuss. The goals of this activity are identify common challenges, challenges uh, share personal experience and solutions in the field, uh, brainstorm new solutions, and at the end, create a collaborative community of modelers. And just some guidelines uh, are on the side of commenting, so you can comment any anytime that you want. But uh, honest debate is always encouraged, and if please mute your microphone uh, when not talking, just always interference with uh, the speakers. So uh, starting with what is gene expression, this is a very broad question. Uh, gene expression covers from the replication of DNA to protein. So basically it's how the information is expressed in something that has an activity that can be either an RNA or a protein, depending on the case. And uh, the most basic theory says that this is something that in the prokaryotes happens in the same place. It just generates the mRNA and ribosomes produces the proteins. While in eukaryotes, this is something that happens in two different places. So we already see differences that are important to consider when we are modeling these kind of cases, because location is something that is going to take a, a role uh, separating these two kinds of kingdoms. But not only this, uh, it was common to, to think that transcription factors were something that were regulating uh, expression, for example, in bacteria. It was, uh, for example, in Escherichia coli, the 70% of the variance in expression can be explained with transcription factors. Uh, but this is not common in eukaryotes, of course. We know that there are other layers of regulation, for example, splicing, uh, other kinds of structural uh, conditions based on the chromosome, uh, et cetera, and the chromatin. Uh, but also in prokaryotes. We know, for example, this is work that we are developing here in the lab. We are defining the regulatory elements that take uh, a role in uh, expression of proteins, or well, in general, of the expression machinery in mycoplasma pneumonia, which is a minimal cell that only has seven transcription factors, and they don't explain basically the model that we have currently. And uh, with the years, we have been characterizing different elements and the effect of uh, for example, genome level regulation, that could be uh, the structure of the chromosome, where which parts of the chromosome are together, which not, 
Uh, supercoiling, which seems to be a very important factor. So if you are uh, upstream, uh, if you are downstream to a gene that is being expressed in a very high rate, this is going to accumulate supercoiling downstream of the gene and it's going to affect the expression of the gene after. So it's something that it starts to take some more network uh, complexity. But as of course, we have operons, we have uh, different factors of elongation, of initiation. We have elements that uh, are more based on metabolism or uh, the availability of specific resources, for example, NTPs. And of course, you always have different levels of degradation and then of translation. This is only uh, what you see in the screen is only uh, for transcription, but you have similar uh, conditions that are quite complex and to disentangle all the factors and all the elements, and which is the, the importance of them, is, is something that requires a lot of, of uh, integration of information and modeling, of course, is something that is a very useful tool. Uh, of course, I, I don't need to mention, but in eukaryotes, this is even more complex. We have uh, many layers of regulation. This is only uh, for primary cells. Uh, so it's more based on the development of this or on the specificity of this kind of cell. But you see that new uh, players come to the equation, for example, splicing, which is something that uh, makes a, a combinatorial complexity for every transcript. You can have many, many combinations depending on the exon intron uh, system that they have. So the, the big picture is that, of course, you have many layers of complexity. You can pick just a couple of genes and try to regulate and uh, model both of them. But if you really want to have something that covers all the biology that you are seeing in the system, uh, complexity arises to levels that requires a uh, uh, levels uh, that requires uh, ways to model this and to integrate the data efficiently in order to have pretty meaningful uh, models. And why uh, is the question? Why we are interested in trying to, to understand this? Of course, uh, the easiest thing that can come is that basically when you have a deregulation or a problem in the regulation of this expression machinery, you, you start to have uh, pathologies, you start to have diseases like could be cancer, which basically everything can be reduced to a, a lack of regulation at the level of expression levels by mutations, by different interactions of different cells with the system. But it can be positive as well. Uh, you can recall examples, for example, to the, for the production of insulin using Escherichia coli. Uh, you require bigger factories, and basically you optimize this process just modifying the regulators of expression in these bacteria. So you can produce uh, a very big amount of this compound just controlling the levels of population and how they express the different uh, factors that they require to produce insulin, for example, but also to treat the same diseases that are generated by the lack of regulation in expression that could be, for example, vidotherapy in order to switch on and off different parts of the system and basically to treat the disease. So um, this was just a very basic introduction to the state of the state of the art, just to put you in the mood to talk about the expression. And if you agree, we are going to start already with the first presentation by uh, Professor Melissa Kingney from University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we will continue with Professor David Arnosti from Michigan State University. So I will stop sharing my screen and Melissa, whenever you want. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can get my screen. Thank you very much, here. Samuel. Um, You're welcome. So I'm... Uh, on, did you want me to start or Melissa? Oh. Who? Uh, it's, it's okay. Uh, up to you. We were thinking about Melissa, but it was yeah, it's a bit right. No, that's we okay. Just started from there, but up yeah, to go you. ahead. Go ahead, <laughs> Melissa. Okay, wonderful. Um, that was a really great intro. Thank you so much for the invitation to present today. Um, and I think that that is, brings up some really important points that hopefully I can start to address in terms of, I think we'll have some interesting discussions about the question of complexity versus how much we can model in, at the genome scale. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today was a project that we've gone through actually looking at different types of modeling and different ways to use um, transcriptomic data to think about stem cells, but walking all the way through things like gene regulatory networks, all the way through to trying to be able to sort of bridge gene and protein networks. So hopefully we'll, this will tie a little bit into things that we talked that we heard about last week from our, or last month from our speakers as well. 
Um, so as I said, I, I think a lot in my lab and in my work about stem cells. And so I'll give you a really brief intro to how, how we think about stem cells and why this is a particularly interesting system to model. So when we think about stem cells, we, we think about this hierarchy often. So what I've shown here is our blood stem cells, but this, you see these sorts of diagrams in all different stem cell types, where we have differences in cell types that can make decisions, whether that's just a linear path of changing from one cell type to closer to another cell type, whether that's at these bifurcations where a cell actually needs to decide to become one cell type or another cell type. Um, and the really big question, I think, as engineers and as people who think about modeling is if we think about having the cell at any given state along this hierarchy, um, we can think about stepping it one step farther and we can figure out, we can kind of look at these discrete time points and see what the different cell fates are, but we really don't understand a lot about this, the really integrated and especially the holistic mechanisms that dictate any of these given steps along a stem cell differentiation process. So when I say differentiation, I mean the change from one cell type or one cell phenotype to something that's incrementally more like another cell type. And in, in the stem cell biology field, we really like to use this cell roll or ball rolling down a hill diagram. Um, but I really like this from the analogy perspective of the, the, the fact that it's a continuum. You wouldn't expect a ball rolling down a hill to make jumps down this path to hit the bottom. It's really a continuous process. And you can think of it as something that is always driving forward. Um, and this is what we think about it when we think of analogies to things like embryonic development. Um, but what's also really fascinating in the stem cell field and also becomes really interesting for some of our models is thinking about things like we now know that the ball doesn't just roll down the hill. So if we, if you uh, refer to the Nobel Prize winning finding that we can actually in, create induced pluripotent stem cells or reprogram stem cells, we can actually kick that ball all the way back up to the top of the hill. Um, and in the last decade or so, we've also realized that you don't actually have to go all the way back up to the top of the hill. We can actually kick this ball kind of over the little hills and valleys. So you can go from one cell type to maybe an adjacent cell type or one that's not so distantly related to it. But I think that as people in the stem cell field have done all, the, all these different manipulations, we're constantly trying to move ourselves from one cell type to another cell type. And I think there's three key questions that constantly come up. And that is one, what, what do my cells actually look like at any given state? How close are they to real bona fide cells? So if I'm trying to make a induced pluripotent stem cell to a cardiac cell or to a blood cell, the question is, are, am I there yet? And then if I'm not there yet, how do I actually get them to look a little bit more like real cells? So what can I manipulate in this sort of gene regulatory network or the cell signaling context to actually get the cells to look a little bit more like a real cell? If you will. And so this was something that um, was pioneered in the daily lab at Boston Children's Hospital by um, two investigators, Patrick Cahan and Sam Morris, who are now at Hopkins and um, WashU St. Louis, respectively. But they created the CellNet algorithm. And this is sort of the basis for and jumping off point for a lot of what we worked on. So I just want to give a quick intro because this is something that was really thought about using gene regulatory networks in sort of a new way that was really exciting. And so what Patrick and Sam did in their algorithm was they basically said, can we figure, can we actually train a classifier to be able to answer all these questions? So they went into publicly available data. Um, I know there was a question last month about collecting publicly available data. So this was thousands of microarrays back in before RNA-seq was a big thing. Um, and they collected thousands of microarrays on, in, in humans, about 17 cell types. Um, and they basically trained classifiers to be able to say, if you put in your own microarray data, so this is an interactive platform, if you in, put your own microarray data in, what cell type does it look like in their training data set? So they use some machine learning types of um, approaches for that. The next part of that was looking at the actual gene networks. Are the, are the gene networks actually consistent with the gene networks from the training data set? And then again, pulling out candidates or actually being able to predict transcription factors that if we manipulate those would get us maybe a little bit closer. And so this was all based on these networks. I keep saying networks. So I just wanted to briefly introduce what we think of as networks here. This is nothing at the level of complexity that we just heard in the intro. This is a very global genome level um, idea of networks. And it's sort of the simplest way we could actually infer a gene network from data sets. So again, we're looking at 2000 plus different data sets. And we're looking at effectively the correlation, <clears throat> or in this case, the mutual information 
between any given gene or transcription factor in a gene. And the really simple hypothesis there is that if a transcription factor in a gene are actually co uh, correlated, that there is some likelihood that that transcription factor does in fact regulate that gene. Obviously, that's a very simplified um, assumption there, but it gets us to the point where we can infer some of these gene regulatory networks. Um, we've, the, the Patrick and Sam used some of the state-of-the-art methods for this sort of gene, net re gene regulatory network inference, where what you end up getting is these transcription factors and the networks of genes that they regulate. Um, and what they, they took it a step further and looked at these as sort of sub-networks. So there's groups of genes that are very tightly clustered with one another, and there's these sub-networks in the global gene regulatory network. And they asked the question, are some of these sub-networks, so the hypothesis here is that genes that are closely related to each other in a network would be functionally related to one another. Um, and so they asked, are there sub-networks or sub-modules of these gene regulatory networks that are actually cell type specific? So if we look at these as a sub-network, can you, can you pull out a neuron-specific sub-network? Can you pull out a smooth muscle cell sub-network and blood cell sub-networks, et cetera? And that's the basis for a lot of their, their algorithm was, can we actually do some of these, the um, predictive classifiers and things like that, looking at these actual networks. So I think that that was one of the really fundamentally exciting parts about CellNet was that it wasn't just, if you look at a lot of other data, um, people have looked at things like, you know, what cell, one cell type versus another cell type. And what the common thing is, let's just find lists of genes but you lose any context about those genes when you just do some sort of p-test between two samples. So I think the fact that this actually keeps the network context in, into the process is something that was really, really exciting about this algorithm. And so just to give you the quick example of what we can actually do with something like this, um, they looked at what I, exactly what I showed you in the beginning, the kind of ball rolling down the hill versus kicking the ball over the hill. Um, so differentiation versus direct conversion. And what they could do is actually look at their training data set versus the, the actual data, the target data set. So if you're trying to take embryonic stem cells, differentiate them to cardiomyocytes, they had a heart training data set. And you can see that those cell, those cell types at, as they sample along the discrete time points in the differentiation, kind of start to take on gene regulatory networks that look very much like the gene regulatory subnetwork for heart cells. Um, and so that was, like I said, very exciting. It's a really well used algorithm and Patrick continues to build upon this and has a single cell um, algorithm and everything that's available as well at this point and, you know, modifying it for RNA-seq and everything too. But our question, coming back to the stem cell question, was, so CellNet was originally trained, as I said, on 17 cell types. And these 17 cell types were the ones that are listed on the left on this slide. They were everything from embryonic stem cells to lung to liver to heart. And so the idea that we could tell a heart cell from a liver cell is probably not, you know, that they're probably quite different. You can imagine that what those subnetworks would look like in those very different cell types. But the question was, how finely tuned can we get to this question? And, and when we think about this in, in the terms of stem cell differentiation, the really big problem arises when we realize that stem cell differentiation, as I said, with the ball rolling down a hill, is more of a continuum than it is something that there are discrete cell types, if you will. So what I've shown here on the top is actually myoblast differentiation. So it's a unipotent stem cell, meaning one cell type differentiates into one cell type. There's no bifurcations at all. And what you see when people actually do a single cell RNA-seq data set on, uh, on that is that there's, there, it really does show up some, somewhat like a continuum. There's not discrete time points, even if we are sampling at discrete time points. And so one of the questions that we came to when we were looking at this, we really wanted to retrain this cell net algorithm for the blood hierarchy. But as I said, the blood hierarchy that I showed you in that first um, slide is more of this continuum. So how do we start to define some of these intermediate cell types? Are there sub-networks of gene regulatory networks that are specific to some of these intermediate subtypes? Or how do we actually start to get at what that looks like? So the goal here, and we ended up moving through, like I said in the beginning, a number of different um, sort of modeling, mostly in the statistical modeling level, um, techniques to try to figure out what, what these gene regulatory networks look like in these different cell types. So the very first question, um, as I said, modeling that hematopoietic di differentiation, I'll focus here on red blood cells as the cell type we cared about um, in this particular example. But what we looked at in this process was the very first question was just, can we tell red blood cells from other cell types? So from that heart, lung, liver, can we tell red blood cells apart? 
that's probably not, you know, not as difficult of a bar. But then if we think about the differentiation as a continuum, starting from that top of the hierarchy and actually down the hill to, to our red blood cells, what, what does that look like in terms of those gene regulatory network dynamics? And this is where we started to hit some problems. Um, and then thinking a little bit more about that black box that I showed you on, the, on this first slide as well of, okay, so we know they go from one state to another state and can we actually figure out what mechanisms in, actually dictate those kinds of state changes. So as I said, we retrained this on the algorithm. We added in red blood cells or what, what they're listed on here as erythroid cells. Um, and we were able to show that we actually pulled out a gene regulatory network, perhaps unsurprisingly, that was specific to red blood cells. Um, and thankfully, this, this gene regulatory network was a lot of things that, that really made a lot of sense. We had 17 transcription factors. A lot of them were very well characterized in red blood cells. If you look at the gene ontology terms, there are things like hemoglobin metabolism, oxygen transport, and a whole bunch of immune-related um, gene ontology biological processes. So it did actually pull out this cohesive subnetwork that actually had a lot of um, a lot of agreement with things we already know about red blood cells. But the big question again was we've got stages of differentiation, right? So can we actually tell anything about the stages of red blood cell differentiation from this gene regulatory network? And the answer is actually no. So if you look at the top, um, we've got this, these really nice histology samples of the different stages of differentiation. Um, these are actually from our cultures. You can see by your eye that they're really different over the course of differentiation morphologically. Um, but if you actually take samples from these different time points, what you see is that they all just classify it as red blood cells. And you don't really see anything different in their gene regulatory networks. Um, so we had this really nice pan red blood cell classifier, and we tried to train it on the sort of more subnetworks, and there was just so much overlap that we couldn't seem to pull out a cohesive module that was specific to each part of this process. Perhaps unsurprisingly, as I showed you, that sort of continuum of differentiation. So we went to the sort of uh, techniques that people have, other people have used to look at these things as more of a continuum. Um, the very first easy pass through this was we looked at principal component analysis to figure out um, what this actual, what, what all of these samples looked like. So what I didn't mention here was we had um, about 165 um, microarray samples from these red blood cells. So every dot on this plot is one microarray sample. And we just did an unsupervised classifier just to see what actually came out of this. And you see that there's some actual little uh, clusters that we can we can identify here. We went back and sort of manually compared this to what we would classify in the literature. And we saw that that, that actually did pretty well capture the biology. We see this sort of the earliest red blood cells or what we're calling CFUs um, are down in that sort of TLC2 cluster. They kind of differentiate through C4, C5, and C6 is a really interesting cluster that I'll come back to later. But what you can see from the graph on the right is that with, there was a lot of uniformity across the, across the clusters. And the nice thing about this, we've moved a little bit out of the network context, but this, this um, principal component analysis is just based on the 235 genes in the gene regulatory network. So that's worth noting. Um, and what we did was uh, sort of interrogated this a little farther. We can ask how do biological, how does, does this tell us something about how the biological processes actually change? Um, and so if you do a gene set enrichment across these, um, across the sort of principal component axes, you see that the first principal component or the x-axis actually um, correlates with heme metabolism, which again, uh, heme metabolism would actually increase during the course of differentiation. So that's pretty consistent. Um, and you see that the second principal component really captures something about proliferation or it's inversely co correlated with NIF targets, which again, knowing that by, uh, red blood cells would proliferate much more in their early differentiation and, and proliferation mostly turns off during differentiation, that also made sense to us. This is also really consistent if you look at how the genes actually fall on the principal component plot. Um, so where the, on the plot on the left, all those dots are microarrays, the plot on the right, every single dot is one of those um, 265 yeah, uh, genes um, in our gene regulatory network. And so again, if you just do an unsupervised clustering, we see a bunch of cell cycle genes, some hemoglobin metabolism genes um, in those G1 and G2 clusters. So we can kind of see this, this shift between um, proliferation and differentiation that's being captured just on a principal component plot. Um, G3, again, correlating with C6 is something I'll come back to. There were no annotations associated with the genes in that cluster, and it's kind of a common theme through our project here. 
Um, and one other thing that we, we wanted to bring this back to a network context, like I said, we moved, we keep moving in and out of networks when I, when I do some of these gene analyses. Um, and one thing that, that wasn't captured with the original cell net was we assumed a static gene regulatory network. Um, and so one thing that we did here was actually retrain those, that, that gene regulatory network inference um, on each of the individual clusters, which admittedly don't have a lot of cell uh, samples per cluster. So it's not the most rigorous that we could do, but what you can see is that um, those, in these little diagrams, each of the dots are one transcription factor and they're in the same location for each of the clusters. But what the sizes of them, the relative sizes are based on their degree or the number of things that uh, other genes that they regulate. And so you can see that doing something like this, you can actually start to infer the relative importance of different transcription factors at different time points. And more than that, we can see that there actually is some dynamics potentially about the way that these networks are rewired. So rather than pulling out a unified subnetwork, it's perhaps more about the way the networks actually work together. And so one other question that we had we, we you know, showed that we could make a red blood cell subnetwork. We showed that there, we could start to infer something about the dynamics of this process. But one thing that was we really wanted to know was that black box of how do you actually figure out some of the molecular mechanisms that are driving the differentiation process. Um, and we really focused on these two clusters, C5 and C6. Um, as I said, so C6 is a really interesting cluster because this was all primary data that came from human reticulocytes. So the reticulocyte is the stage um, right as the cell enters the, red, the bloodstream where it has just spit out its nucleus. Um, and the late erythroblast stage is basically as far as we can get in a cell culture plate. We actually get to that point in a cell culture plate and they kind of arrest and they don't really enucleate. So it's a really interesting question of why we can't actually get them to jump past this and mature. And we were really interested in whether we could use this data to ask that question. And so the way that we ended up going about this um, was we used a um, regression-based algorithm to be, to be able to pull out a group of genes. So this is the lasso algorithm or the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. And what that algorithm does is effectively find the set of genes that, that most separates the two clusters from one another. And so there's 27 genes here. Some of them are correlated with the late erythroblast stage. Some of them are correlated with reticulocytes. And if you Google each one of them individually, there are some interesting ones in there. But again, I've popped us back out of that network context. And so it's really hard to get back to understanding cohesively what do all these genes go, uh, how, what do all these genes do together? Um, and so this is where we actually investigated a number of different network approaches to try to figure out what, how, what unifies all of these genes. And so we had three hypotheses really here. Um, and we, uh, we kind of looked through three different modeling techniques to be able to figure this out. The first and most obvious was just, let's go back to our gene regulatory networks, right? If we map these 27 genes onto our gene regulatory networks, we could ask what, what unifies this, right? If, we, if our hypothesis is that there's a core tra transcription factor or set of transcription factors that, that regulate all 27 genes, if we just tweak those, will actually be able to then go in and you know, change, change our differentiation process just via transcription factors. Coming from the stem cell field, we love transcription factors. We know that the Yamanaka factors can do things. We know we can use transcription factors to change, to directly reprogram cells. So our first approach was to use transcription factors, or to try to find those transcription factors. And this is a really interesting case because we looked at the sort of first order um, transcription factors in the gene regulatory network. Um, our, our global gene regulatory network. And what we expected to see was some overlap between these, these, 27, um, these 27 lasso targets being regulated by some core set of genes. And we didn't see that at all. We saw sort of a one-to-one. -one. There, were, there were just modules of transcription factors that were regulating each one sort of separately. Um, and that was really, it, really interesting biologically. At this point of, of biological differentiation, if we think about it, we're thinking about a point where the cell is starting to condense its chromatin and about to spit out its nucleus. So maybe at this point, we're actually, it, maybe this is a biological phenomenon in this particular cell type, that transcription is not the mode of differentiation at this point. Um, but it was really interesting to us that we kind of hit this wall at this point of not being able to figure out what actually controls this via the gene regulatory networks. And so we moved up a level. We thought, okay, so maybe there's all these different transcription factors regulating all these different genes, but maybe there's something unifying up a level from that in the protein signaling networks that actually might control a lot of that downstream signaling. 
And so what we did here, and this hopefully will serve as a little bit of a bridge to our last seminar on protein signaling, though, at, again, a much larger level than sort of that, the more deterministic signaling models that we heard about. Um, what you can see is I actually, so what I did was I used a protein-protein interaction network from the string database as a scaffold. And we use this algorithm called the prize collecting Steiner forest. And this is really a path of least resistance algorithm. So if you think about trying to connect all of my 27 lasso nodes, um, and we know something about the confidence that all these, all these different um, protein nodes in the, in the interactome are connected. If you see that example in the bottom left corner, you would basically know that, that, that it's, um, it cost, it's a cost, balance, a cost balance sort of scenario where it, cost, it costs less to go on the sort of left path that's 0.2 to 0.7 versus the other path that would be 1.5. So it's, like I said, path of least resistance um, and kind of an optimization algorithm that was developed by the Franco Lab at MIT. Um, and so what we did, again, was use the string database. And we mapped all of those 27 genes onto the string database using this PCSF algorithm. And this is really interesting um, because what we ended up coming up with was this realization that each of these, and it's really consistent with what we had seen in the gene regulatory network, each of these 27 genes were sort of the end of very different biological processes. And so you see some, some of these were related to things like apoptosis, some were related to cell cycle, stress responses. There were all these different processes that were kind of being captured by this lasso signature, which is really nice to see that we were able to actually capture a signature that didn't have a lot of redundancy in it. Um, and, that there, and that we were then able to kind of connect those back to a core pathway. Um, and one thing to note here, the center is, is P53, um, which is the center of a lot of processes, but I'll come back to that at the very end here. Um, but we started kind of looking at all these different processes and trying to figure out what this means for being able to actually manipulate the cell, being able to manipulate a pathway. Um, and what, the way we actually looked at this, we, we did this a whole number of different ways that we could try to set, find some trends in what pathways seemed to be uh, affected during these pro this, this differentiation process. So the last, the last way was really simple. We actually just looked at a, a really basic correlation analysis, not any network related anything, just looking at other genes that correlate with our lasso genes so that we could look at things like enrichment of other pathways as well. And we did this just for the sake of co consistency between our other modeling approaches. And what we saw was a lot of the same things, which was nice. Um, things related to cell cycle and P53. And um, if you look at some enrichment of, of potential receptors and ligands that would be mediating these pathways, we started to see some things coming out about the ERB pathway and things like EGF and TGF alpha, which were all sort of related to the same pathways. Um, so I've told you about a whole bunch of different models now. And what the really challenging part of this was actually trying to figure out what the actual hypothesis was from this. And so that's a point I think that is really common in modeling. It's really easy to get from 20,000 genes to 200, but getting from 200 to a mechanism is a really, really huge challenge. And I think that moving down different types of modeling is one of the approaches. But what we ended up doing here was kind of just using our own biological background to rationalize. We kept seeing things like cell cycle apoptosis, DNA damage repair, P53. And then we started seeing aspects of this or EGF or B signaling pathway that were coming up. And from our bi biological background, those were all related. The model, our models, unfortunately, do not know that those are all related, but we as biologists did. Um, so we ended up following up on the RB signaling pathway. And I won't talk about this exhaustively, but we went through and we actually validated and we found that RB4, which is not actually a very well studied molecule, um, it's one of the um, EGFR signaling family members, but it's sort of the least studied and the sort of very different than the other EGFR signaling uh, members is involved in red blood cell development. Um, it's actually really involved in, in blood cell development in general. We saw really sort of gross dysregulation of the whole blood um, compartment when we uh, used some inhibitors on this and when we looked at it in an knockout mouse. Um, and then I'll just bring that all the way back around full circle once more where we used, um, we followed up and actually used inhibitors of this e, uh, RB signaling pathway and then did RNA-seq on our samples. And what, what you see here in the red and blue um, are inhibitors that inhibit ERB4. They're kind of pan ERB inhibitors. Um, and lapatinib, the one that's in white, does not inhibit, it inhibits the other three EGFR family members, but not ERB4. And what you can see here is that the ones that are really specific to EGFR in our samples did actually upregulate P53, which was a nice confirmation that we weren't just getting an overrepresented node in our network, that this, the, in that string network. 
Um, and what we ended up following up on is using this actually then to move forward and find a druggable target, which was the went beta catenin pathway and treat ourselves with that. So taking it all the way from a model to actually being able to bring it back to the dish and then back to our back to, into the computational space again. Um, so what I've hopefully been able to show you here is looking at something for all the way from the level of global gene regulatory networks and sort of really discrete cell types to thinking a little bit more about this really complex problem of, of cell dynamics and this continuum of cells and how we can actually start to get at what a gene regulatory network looks like in a continuum of cells. And then finally thinking about what networks look like when cells are differentiating in the, on the, in the molecular signaling space, whether that's a gene regulatory based or sort of protein signaling networks. Um, and all this work was done during my postdoc um, in the Daly and Laufenberger labs at MIT and, and Boston Children's Hospital. And with thank, thanks to Sam Morris and Patrick Cahan, who actually got the CellNet algorithm up and running and started. And I'm really excited to talk more about everyone's thoughts and hear on, from our next speaker. So thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa, for your presentation. So we move to Professor David Arnosti. We will discuss later. So if you have any question, you can write it in the chat. So we will take note and discuss later. OK, thank you very much. So I hope I'm coming through. I'll share my screen. I wanted to uh, thank Melissa for that high level introduction on the global scale. I'm going to be focusing at a more detailed level of gene regulatory questions. And before I turn on my PowerPoints, I just wanted to say it's especially appropriate that one of our Host Samuel is studying at the Pampu Fab University. Um, I looked that up on Wikipedia, and it turns out not only was Pampu Fab uh, engineer, but also really interested in linguistics and was uh, a master of the Catalan language. And in fact, today I'm going to be talking about the grammar of DNA and the cis regulatory grammar of enhancers. So there's kind of a nice connection there. So let's mm -hmm. share my laptop and this talk here. Um, so my laboratory is interested in the study of uh, regulatory mechanisms of eukaryotic enhancers in development. And that has led us into questions of how do we understand these at a quantitative level. We've used Drosophila as a model system, as a very excellent way to attack some of these problems and a model for higher eukaryotic processes. So uh, I'm going to give us some perspective on this field and go back to the late 19th century where Hans Driesch, who was also interested in how embryos work, had gotten to the point of experimentally manipulating embryos and understanding the basic processes of development that he was sure that we were on the verge of a breakthrough. He wrote this um, monograph, The Analytical Theory of Organic Development in the late 1800s which explained exactly how development works. And of course, we know that there were a few bumps in the road still and some mysteries. And in fact, with uh, more work in his field by his own lab and colleagues, eventually he grew kind of disillusioned by this concept that we could mechanistically understand embryos. And he ended up in a rather um, isolated, vitalistic, um, school of thought all the way into the 20th century saying that, well, it can't just be physics. There must be some magic involved because it's too complicated. And I, I would say that now at the beginning of the 21st century, now with the molecular tools in hand, some of which Melissa has described, uh, we can actually drive and uh, derive and describe gene regulatory networks here. This is one from uh, the very same kind of embryos that Dries was interested in. We're looking at a network connecting expression of a series of transcription factors early in the Drosophila embryo. And those of you who are specialists in gene regulatory networks might recognize incoherent feed forward designs here, something that Uri Alon, one of your previous speakers, I believe, uh, described first in looking at gene regulatory networks in bacteria. So there are certain aspects of these GRNs that seem to be universally conserved. So uh, most of the data relating to gene regulatory networks now comes from very high level, um, omics level analyses such as those described by Dr. Kinney. And most of the analysis of how these networks work use, um, I would say statistical approaches 
where lots of data can be crunched at the same time, and there are many different ways of doing that. However, uh, some of us really want to understand mechanistic uh, consequences to these gene regulatory networks, and so we need to go back to enhancers. What are transcriptional enhancers? Originally described almost 40 years ago by Walter Schaffner at the University of Zurich, uh, these were initially found as bits of viral sequences that worked in a distant orientation independent manner to regulate gene expression and later on identified in higher eukaryotes as part of cellular genes too. So work for instance uh, from my postdoctoral mentor Michael Levine showed that these colorful bits of regulatory DNA shown near the even skip gene. I think, uh, can you see my uh, uh, cursor on the screen? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Uh, these regulatory bits of DNA are actually independent enhancers which program the expression of certain stripes or patterns of expression in the early embryo. So even skip was one of the first genes to be analyzed, which led us to the understanding that in fact, enhancers can function in an additive manner to build complex patterns. So early on, John Reinitz, one of the scientists trained with Levine's lab, suggested that if we read the inputs to these enhancers, and these inputs are shown as curves indicating uh, localized protein concentrations in the early embryo, we can understand that the enhancer that's a bit of DNA that binds to transcription factors. The inputs are these transcription factors, and we could compute then the logic of that enhancer, which at the time was a very daunting prospect given the paucity of information there. But he described a thermodynamic type of modeling approach which would essentially compute the inputs of these different transcription factors. And uh, one of the results of this early work, um, in fact, this paper involves uh, Yogi Yeager, a former colleague at CRG, um, led to the realization that if we consider computationally how a bunch of binding sites shown here as colorful boxes on a bit of DNA, uh, if we consider different models of how those binding sites might interact, we can actually explain the dynamics of the even skipped stripe two enhancer shown in these gray in situ hybridization images of embryos during developmental time as the expression of that gene comes up and narrows into a very specific stripe shown here in figure F. Um, one of the insights from this paper was that it, it looked like scattered binding sites that were not uh, necessary but were um, also contributing to activity might be required for the overall output of this enhancer. And those, those binding sites actually hadn't been identified experimentally. They were identified first computationally. So as technology in this field uh, developed, then investigators such as Alex Stark in Vienna uh, uh, went after enhancer identification on a whole genome scale using uh, two different approaches. One of those is transgenesis, where bits of genomic DNA are inserted into animals and tested individually. Similar works from the uh, Axel Wiesel lab in Berkeley have worked on mouse enhancers. This is a very labor intensive process. Uh, Stark in uh, his uh, Kvan et al paper uh, surveyed around 15% uh, of the genome and then many bits of DNA actually appeared to work as enhancers as shown by these developmental patterns in embryos. Later on, they developed methods that allowed them a comprehensive survey of the entire genome. In this case, the model organism Drosophila has a genome less than 10% the size of humans. And that was based on StarSeq technology where bits of DNA are introduced on self-transcribing reporters and then assayed in a particular cell type. So these are complementary. In one case, you get the cell type and temporal specific information. In the other case, you just get one cell type, but you can really test everything. So it turns out that it's actually more complicated than that, that this is not a comprehensive analysis of all enhancers. Other types of studies, for instance, the Phantom Consortium uh, from the Hayashizaki lab and colleagues uh, screened through many, many um, transcriptomic data sets from human cells and came to the conclusion that there seemed to be about 200,000 promoters for 
about 25,000 genes. Many genes have multiple promoters and they could identify more than 65,000 human enhancers. Um, so what kind of uh, classification was used here? In this case, they were just measuring bidirectional transcription based on trapping uh, capped RNAs. So RNA polymerase in, in eukaryotes produces capped RNA. That's a special chemical signal that's used by the cell to make sure that mRNA is detected as such. And if you count up all RNAs that have these little caps, you can map them to the genome. And in this case, the Phantom Consortium noted that enhancers seem to have bidirectional transcription. So anything that appears to have bidirectional transcription is classified as an enhancer and unidirectional more or less transcription is a promoter. Okay, so that's where we get most of the information on enhancers based on these kind of studies. We don't actually know biologically whether these are important enhancers or they're real enhancers. Uh, computational approaches like O'Connor and Bailey correlates the extent of transcription of these would-be enhancers to nearby genes. And when there's a strong correlation, then you make a link between that enhancer and the gene. So there are different ways of doing this, but the essential logic is that if it's an active enhancer, it'll look active in tissues or samples where the promoter nearby is firing. So how do you define an enhancer? Nowadays, most enhancers are defined by, as I've said, physical properties. There's some proteins stuck to it. There's an epigenetic mark. There's enhancer RNA. Um, that it correlates to transcription of some gene, although that can be challenging because enhancers can work at a distance. Uh, in some cases, they seem to be evolutionarily conserved, and uh, often they can work as a regulatory element in a reporter assay, as I've described for Stark. Or nowadays with CRISPR strains, we can mutate them en masse and see a measurable effect on gene expression. There are many false positives and negatives to each of these. And so I think an area that has not yet been tapped, which will complement them, is using population variation, which our population geneticists tell us are essentially the result of natural experiments that we just need to understand. So now I'll look at two approaches people have used applying mathematical uh, measures to actually look at enhancer activity. And why would we want to use mathematical models rather than just um, summing data sets? Uh, in some cases, these models are good for understanding the general principles of how genes get regulated in networks. In some cases, they can allow us to identify links between a regulon and a regulator, which might be useful. And in other cases, they might uh, allow us to predict how a gene regulatory network is going to run in cancer or under stress, for instance. So just some personal biases is those models are very good, but I don't like them when they're applied just to fit a particular data set. Sometimes you'll read a paper where the very last figure is a model that fits. And oftentimes it's done in a way that you can only conclude that it's possible to fit a model to the data, but it wasn't really predictive. So that's not so fun. Um, and that can involve just confirming your pre-existing hunches using tenuous assumptions buried in the math. A better model is one that challenges your assumptions or maybe turns up aspects that you hadn't thought about. And finally, if it's published in the Journal of Theoretical Biology, then many of us biologists don't read it. So that's a bias in the field. I don't know if that's good or not. So a couple of methods that have been used for this kind of modeling to understand an enhancer is a thermodynamic model. These use information about the sequence of an enhancer, the proteins bound to it, and it's kind of a snapshot. It's a pseudo equilibrium that tells you how that thing is working. The idea is that if you think about a regulatory element that's bound by different factors, say green, blue, and red, at any one moment in time, you might have green or green and blue or all three of them bound. And the uh, uh, complete description of all bound states plus the fractional occupancy, like mostly it's all three, but very rarely none, gives you a picture of the overall output of the gene. So this is called a thermodynamic model or a uh, fractional occupancy model. Advantage to that is you can drive many different kinds of models 
and infer parameters such as how these proteins talk to each other locally over a long range. You can infer different blue or green parameters. Um, another kind of modeling approach people have used at a, a higher level is uh, differential equations, which refer to the dynamic processes that are link genes together. In many cases, these models use the promoter as a black box. It just has some sort of output, but it does incorporate post-transcriptional processes, including production of protein, the action of those proteins on other genes, and this provides a movie. So it's rather than one snapshot, you can link genes together and see how they work. Uh, typically, the guts of these models involve differential equations in which we have things such as RNA diffusing and RNA decaying and RNA being translated into protein and those proteins diffusing and decaying. And put together, you can actually come up with very sophisticated models. Unfortunately, you can also have lots of uh, parameters which might lead to overfitting. Uh, finally, a third approach that people have used for this transcription kind of modeling is Boolean models using simple operators such as and, or, not, and so forth. And uh, the advantage to using these Boolean operators is it's coarse grained. Uh, it's easier to uh, carry out complex computations because they're rather um, plus minus kind of signs. It also gives you dynamic pictures on a coarser grain. Uh, just regarding this last kind of modeling, the um, Boolean model was probably applied at its most elegant level by the Davidson lab looking at sea urchin developmental genes. This is the regulatory region adjacent to endo-16, a developmental region uh, gene in the sea urchin larva. The little colorful circles show different kinds of proteins that bind on different portions of this uh, 2KB regulatory region. And by doing lots of experiments and then uh, modeling with a Boolean model, they were able to derive uh, a model that successfully describes how different proteins acting on different parts of the enhancer would talk to each other. And linking these together, then you get a gene regulatory network that describes development for this organism. Um, Davidson describes a very uh, complex process of experimental data generation and validation, which then led to modeling and then computation to see if they could actually describe that. And in fact, to understand the tissue specific regulation in different stages of the larva here just shown in schematic form at the left, and to understand how perturbing the networks could lead to changes, for instance, instead of just one cell type being purple, the entire embryo being purple, um, they were able to use a gene regulatory network that was highly predictive, leading Davidson and colleagues to ask, is in fact at a mechanistic level development Boolean, that is cells change into a new fate once you trip some certain levels of regulatory factors and it doesn't really matter how much you produce. So that idea of biology was very much impacted by the successes of their modeling that perhaps organisms just trip some genes and once you're positive for a regulatory factor, it doesn't matter whether you're low or high, um, then you go on in developmental fate. The question is still not resolved. I think many of us having studied individual finely tuned genes are averse to this kind of picture, but I would say that in general, we don't know the answer in how many cases is, are we looking at a more or less Boolean kind of process. Applying thermodynamic modeling to understand enhancer function, I'll just give you a, a taste of that. So enhancers in our system, this even skip gene, evolve much faster than the protein coding genes. This is from Mike Eisen's paper. This orange region shows protein coding regions that are conserved across many species of Drosophila. The regulatory regions functionally are conserved but you can see that there are fewer black lines, meaning that the sequences diverge because the binding sites move around. This led us to propose a model for these enhancers that a bound regulatory factor ensemble over time through evolution can suffer indels, which move those binding sites around and slightly shift the output of the enhancer shown on that abstract landscape at the top. And as long as the uh, proteins uh, 
play by the rules. That's a cis regulatory grammar. You still have conserved function, but the binding sites have moved so much that you can't align them by blast. So it makes it difficult. So what, what is this grammar that they're constrained by? That could be the spacing, the stoichiometry of activators to repressors, or the way the sites are arranged or binding affinity, uh, some complex of those. So the idea would be if you knew what the grammar is, you'd look at a enhancer sequence, you'd compute its output on this regulatory surface, you would measure the inputs, such as these protein regions in the embryo, and say, well, given the surface and these, this state of proteins, that should generate an output that looks like this. So the tricky part here is what kind of model would allow you to look at DNA sequences and then generate a realistic surface? So uh, two assumptions here are that the motifs are important, the binding motifs are important and informative, and that there are constraints like cooperativity or not so cooperative. In fact, in our field, what was missing was not so much the idea, but more or less the high quality data set. So in this study that I'll describe, we generated that high quality data set and then did modeling on it. Essentially, we took uh, two activators, red and yellow, and one repressor, green. When they act together on an enhancer, they paint a stripe on the embryo where there's repression in the very bottom, the green region. Uh, this is the enhancer that we modeled. It's 300 base pairs from rhomboid. We used transgenic animals and measured the expression in embryos by doing standard transgenesis in flies. And then the perturbation analysis involved knocking out particular key sites on the regulatory regions, one, two, or more activators, or also repressors, and then measuring quantitatively the results of that perturbation analysis. So. This red is the wild type output. Green is an endogenous gene that we measured at the same time. When we um, measure that quantitatively, then we can see where it's repressed and where it's activated and then where it's not active anymore. So this red is just a plot of this black line here. And then we did the analysis. When we knocked out single sites, we got kind of similar responses. When we knocked out double sites, some of those were more catastrophic than others. That's the basic data set here, also knocked out repressors. And then, as I said, for thermodynamic models, we uh, considered states of the enhancer where nothing was bound or only repressors or repressors and activators, and then used those and put specific models where the repressors talk to the activators with different kind of potencies and that the activators talk to the activators also with different kind of potencies. That would be parameters that we estimated. We used a genetic algorithm here because there's a lot of parameter space to explore. So we had 38 constructs to fit, and we had in the end 120 different models that we fit. And some models, uh, red shows the modeling and the dots show the actual output. Some models at the top were fitting all 38 pretty well. And some models at the bottom were not fitting the dotted output very well. This bottom model, for instance, consistently failed to uh, get transcriptional repression. Uh, this is just a heat map showing how 120 different models that use slightly different uh, formulations of enhancer-enhancer interactions. And up at the top left, you see models with a few parameters. At the bottom right, the models with the most parameters this is somewhat worrisome because any model will fit when you throw in enough in, uh, parameters. But we did have a sweet spot where there weren't quite so many uh, parameters that we were doing best. So there must be some information here. Uh, looking across 38 different constructs, we could see how different models listed from one to 120 did. Some of the constructs were harder to model, and those were ones that actually represented uh, more unique perturbations, so there was less information to compare. And we did standard cross-validation and fitting to look at these. Um, this just gives you a flavor of some of the models. Some models simply had one parameter for cooperativity, shown as blue lines, connecting the different regulatory regions on the enhancer. And, um, I'm just going to say some models had more complex parameters where local interactions are purple, distal interactions are this kind of tan, and then we had different kinds of parameters. So 
this is a, a physical description of the kinds of parameters we put in. And uh, when we looked at the model, so we would typically fit each model with multiple runs and look at the root mean square error. You can see these runs on this particular model give similar RMSEs, but the parameters inferred in some cases uh, were very different from each other. Like the potency for the activators were either high or low. And we could actually see evidence of parameter compensation that uh, a run on the model which said, what if this is a potent activator, then it doesn't need to be cooperative. So, okay, that's a little bit uh, telling you that these inferred parameters may not be telling you about physical reality, but rather how you can fit a model. Uh, one thing that was interesting though here is that the a potency for the repressors generally went down with distance. And that's an important in a, in a moment I'll just make. So what do you learn from doing this modeling? In this case, what we found is that there were consistent trends right across many different kinds of models. And that is when we consider activators, these green circles, most of the models that were fitting best suggested that cooperativity didn't care about distance. That means if you have a protein bound to the enhancer, it's helping the other ones regardless of whether it's nearby. That sounds like antagonism of chromatin or recruiting of chromatin remodeling complexes, something that fits into biological knowledge that we were aware of. Whereas for repressors, we did not see that kind of cooperativity. And in fact, mechanistic studies from our lab have shown that these repressors actually seem to work on a very individualistic manner to heterochromatinize the gene and, and they don't care who's bound nearby. So we did get some biological insights. It was also quite interesting that these models could predict data that were not part of the fitting set. So for instance, the repressors, in this case, the red balls, had previously been analyzed that they only work within very short distances of the activators. There's a distance dependence. And these, the, the good models could actually capture that. So red, uh, red repressors close by work and repress in ventral regions. When you move them just a little bit farther away, they don't work. And in fact, our models were able to predict that. So we're clearly pulling some general properties, at least for these proteins. And that worked also on uh, evolutionarily derived sequences, which I'm not going to go into other than you move the binding sites around and we're still getting similar kind of properties from these models. So putting together, using this very high resolution cis regulatory grammar and combining that with global data like chip data, phylogenetic comparisons, measurements of factors and expression patterns will allow us then to make quantitative predictions of GRNs uh, on a, a much more detailed basis than ever before. So um, thanks for listening. Thanks to our collaborators and NIH for supporting it and the great people in my group. And I'll be happy to take some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Nosti. So we don't have that much time to discuss, but uh, uh, I will keep in track of the audience if you have any question. Uh, but I would like to start with uh, the probably the most basic question that we can take from here. That is that you presented uh, both the statistical and mechanistic modeling approaches. And in my opinion, my impression is that they usually don't uh, meet each other uh, many times. So it's basically like I, I, it's like quite disconnected. And I don't really know if you see this like something more uh, that can be compatible. So you have one on the other side and you can add different things to each of the models. And if you think that it is necessary to have something trying to, to come up with something, putting everything together in a mechanistic and a statistical approach, in order to have the good advantages of, of, each, of the modeling approach that you presented. So it, I think that question was to me. I think mm -hmm. that Lisa might also have some comments about that. I would say that uh, we still have a uh, severe disconnect, not only between these two fields, that is, can we actually understand at a biochemical basis the action of regulatory factors on one element uh, compared to omics approach. Um, but also, 
uh, when you consider human disease studies, many, many times we want to know why variation in some region of the genome is causing a phenotype. GWAS studies, for instance. And it's a major challenge to assess, first of all, um, if you see a single nucleotide polymorphism that's associated with diabetes or, or uh, something like that, is that functional? And if it's actually in a regulatory region, how does that impact in which cell type? And um, those, those are major challenges which people are working at, but it's, it's a very uh, challenge, very difficult area right now. I don't know, Melissa, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I think that there's definitely a need to be moving back and forth between these two different types of models. I think that people are producing so much data right now that we're seeing a lot of these sort of more statistical models and things coming up. But I don't think that that's where papers should be ending right now. Um, I think that finding these sub networks and things are at best a hypothesis generation. And then the next steps beyond that, in my opinion, are to actually sort of zoom in on those subnetworks and actually do more experiments and start to perturb those more specifically and use some of these methods to model. And there is sort of a chasm in between those of like actually finding a small enough network that is feasible to model in a more deterministic way and such. So there's certainly challenges on the computational side of that, but I think that modeling is not a one end point kind of approach where I think it should, it's more of a cyclical approach where we should be thinking about trying to move back and forth between these like sort of large picture hypotheses where you are mapping something like GWAS or something, finding some sort of module that you're interested in and then actually studying it in more detail. Another point regarding that is, uh, the, and going back to this question about Boolean computation, like what defines a cell state and how tightly regulated is that? And how important are subtle transitions? It could be that through the process of development that there are a series of irreversible or mostly irreversible switches that are triggered, which we don't capture with transcript omics uh, because RNA is not the whole, the whole thing and they're dynamic processes. So feedback loops could be engaged, which essentially are, are unidirectional and uh, that's something that we still have to understand. If you look at cancer research, many times uh, cancer cells that are treated with various kinds of chemotherapy develop, res develop resistance and it appears that relatively few changes can um, allow cells to escape whatever kind of signaling you're doing. And that suggests that it's sort of a, a fragile state, that it's um, that you just have to switch a couple of switches and you can move into, well, a metastatic state in this case, from a quiescent state. So uh, we, we want to be able to uh, be sensitive enough to detect how, if you just change one aspect, one signaling pathway, how, how does that perturb it? I think that's where engineers are really good at uh, an analyzing systems and propagation of signals. That's something we should be thinking about. Um, in the same direction, I, I would like to ask like, uh, well, it's more for Melissa, but uh, in your models, uh, probably things like collinearities and uh, uh, sources of information that maybe they are not, uh, not curated in a, in a high level, for example, you were mentioning that you were using a string databases, but as far as I know, they use as well, for example, if uh, two genes appear in the same abstract, they are already interacting for them. So if there's a way to control for all these kinds of things that usually they are not uh, really easy to detect in your data sets or really to get so deep in the, how the information is extracted to really account for these factors that of course they are taking uh, they are they are playing a role in in the model and in the way the, that we interpret the data. Yeah, I think I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, the question was about how um, things that we're not capturing with basic correlation based analysis. There's a, there's a ton that you don't catch, honestly. Um, this is meant to be very high level. We can't look at if you per, if you knock out a gene, how that network is going to change. Um, in my experience with it, you don't capture um, inhibitory relationships very well. These negative correlations, especially in microarray data, are just mm. really tough to capture. Um, and also things like positive and ne negative autoregulation aren't always captured. 
things that really actually could change dynamics and systems a lot. Um, and so what we get with these gene regulatory networks is a very high level. You can start to find trends about hubs or, or you know, genes that regulate a lot of other genes and, you know, sort of shortest path kinds of things where you might be able to find a target that connects two modules together or something along those lines. But I think that you just, you can't get down to the level of understanding actually how genes interact with other genes until you either start to look at them in a more perturbed, temporally sensitive manner, or you start to integrate other types of data with it. Thanks. Something to, to add, David? Sorry, what was that? No, I, I was saying that if uh, other speaker, Professor Arnoff, you want to... I did have a question for Melissa, actually. Uh, sure. Some of your analysis use PCA, which can mm -hmm. find the biggest differences. What about uh, TSNA or other analysis that would look at uh, comprehensive but more subtle changes over, like, in a whole network? That's a great question because everyone's starting to use TSNE and UMAP and all those other ones. Um, we only looked at the linear PCA at this point. Um, and it would be really interesting to go back to that data. I, I, the really big difference is that most people are using like whole genome types of approaches to train those or to look at those TISNI and UMAP kinds of um, things where we were looking at a smaller number of smaller number of samples and a smaller number of genes than most people are typically looking at. So I don't know if that those nonlinear relationships would kind of skew the data in certain ways with a smaller number of genes, but it's something that would be really interesting to go back and double check. I see. So, okay, thank you very much. I think we are going to, to just wrap up this uh, session and say the thanks again to our two speakers. Uh, you can contact us, the organizers, and probably them just following the links that you have in the website. So, uh, hope to see you next uh, month. So that is going to be on March 9th. So, it's going to be Monday, not Tuesday. So, just uh, make, mark that in your calendar and see you next session. Thank you very much. Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.